people first organizations will win in the future of work. Your only real asset is your people. We, we all, all want purpose driven work. work. HR led organization is. I'm the sorry, but leaders don't lead empty desks and empty shop floors. Welcome to the People Strategy Leaders Show. I'm your host, Sri Chalapa, founder and president of Engagedly, and a serial entrepreneur in technology, films, and music. This is where we talk to people leaders, business strategists, and organizational savants about leading in the time of change. What is working, what is not working, and more importantly, what we should be thinking about. Stick around to the end of the show. We will reveal how you can be our next guest. And now, let's engage. Hello, this is Sri Chalapa with People Strategy Leaders Podcast. And today I am excited, actually, I'm a big fan of uh, Kelly Stephen Weiss, who um, is the head of workforce innovation products with ServiceNow. And prior, she was the founder and CEO of Hitchworks, which was actually acquired by ServiceNow a few months ago. She founded and commercialized Hitch, an internal talent mobility platform that uses AI and machine learning to match project-based opportunities and to uh, and internal uh, employee skills while CIO and CHRO at Here Technologies. With 13 years as CHRO in technology, she's a thought leader and a frequent speaker in the future of work. She's a board member of Form Factor, a member of the USF MSOD Advisory Board, and a co-author of the Inside Gig, which is one of my favorite books uh, in this space. Well, welcome to the show, Kelly. It's it's such an exciting time to talk about the subject. Thank you so much, and it's great to be here. Well, I'll start off with, you know, uh, I read your book about a year or so ago and and you and Edie Goldberg co-authored that book. And it was actually one of my favorite books. I recommended the book to a lot of people. And, um, you know, one of the pet peeves I think I had uh, while I was in consulting is the uh, whole concept of concept of talent hoarding, you know, and managers and and, uh, other directors or other leaders hoarding their talent and building empires based on the number of people they have and whatnot. And not really sharing that wide widespread, because that's how the over, overall organization benefits. So um, I'm glad you wrote a book about that. So what it, what trend did you see that really led you to uh, build Hit in the first place? Well, one of the things that um, sort of the problem statements that I saw was that so many people were leaving organizations because they. Uh, did not have a chance to, the organization didn't know who they were, didn't understand their skills. They were getting bored in their roles. They weren't able to contribute on a broad basis. Um, And it really depended on which manager you had. If you had a great manager that gave you access to opportunities, um, really knew your skills and capabilities, you know, was a home run for you. But if not, Um, you often could get stuck. And sometimes even if you were really good, uh, managers didn't want to let go of you. And of course that led to talent hoarding. Um, And so what I tried to do, uh, certainly what what I attempted to do was build software to resolve this issue when I couldn't find something and to write a book to my peer group about how to do this better. You know, I was one of those employees that was incredibly bored and locked into the box called a job and never able to contribute on a broad basis. And I always had to, I always had to create opportunities for myself. I thought there has to be a better way to do this. Yeah. I think when I remember my career, when I was, I started my career, um, I'm not going to name the company, but uh, people can look it up obviously. (laughs) But uh, one of the things is after a few months or a few quarters, I was like, I really need to do more. I want to do more. And I'm, I don't, I'm not asking for more money or even a change in job title. I just wanted to go and contribute to other teams where I felt like I had something to contribute because I came from a very diverse educational background. I did, I did engineering. I had finance background. I had marketing background. So there was a lot of diversity in my education and my interests where I could contribute to multiple different departments. Um, and I was not, my, my manager at the time did not like that at all. And I was secretly interviewing with other managers so I could get out of that group. And eventually, you know what happened? I quit uh, because the rule at that time was unless your manager gave permission, you couldn't move internally and you had to stay in that group for at least two years. And this is not stay with the company, but stay in that team for two years. I mean, my manager was great. I didn't have any problems with my manager and the work was okay. It wasn't uh, you know, really that bad, but 
the fact that I could not progress with my interests, I feel like I'm in my 20s, I really need, want to be, this is the time I really want to start exploring my different um, you know, ideas and skills. And I, and I quit. And I think with what you are doing with Hitch and now as part of ServiceNow, I'm assuming that's what it's going to prevent from people uh, from Absolutely. Uh, you hear the, you know, when, when you're young, your parents might have given you the lecture, if you love something, set it free and it will come back to you. Right. Um, one of the premises in my book is you get what you give. Uh, you know, uh, it's counterintuitive to think that if you let your employees have choice, if you give them opportunities to contribute on a broader basis, that somehow you're going to lose something in it. And what the research tells us, and certainly my practical experience, is that every time I let somebody contribute elsewhere, their work product went up uh, in their day job, um, and I held on to them longer. So I, yes, uh, one of the things that, you know, the core premise for acquiring Hitch, uh, you know, ServiceNow, um, wanted what we were doing around skills intelligence, but also the fact that we had so much practical experience implementing this type of agile and digital transformation inside these companies around talent. So, you know, so many organizations are struggling to retain their people. Um, and, you know, again, you, you run this sort of counter to what, you know, is popular um, is letting your people sort of roam about the company. Um, that's, that's just not what we were incented to do as managers. We were incented to hoard. Mm -hmm. So this is also something that just has to change. So when you think about talent mobility, you know, I think of there are two basic constructs, right? One is the construct of, I'm still working in this job as a, maybe as a software engineer or, or whatever the role is in this, with this manager. But I get to play around with marketing a little bit because there's some interesting topics I want to write about in a blog, uh, or I want to be on a webinar or talk about something. Right? I can do that. So that's where you're contributing a portion of yourself. The other construct is moving to a different job because I am I've learned everything I wanted to learn. It just doesn't interest me anymore. So which of those two constructs? Uh, I, I see organizations struggling with both constructs actually, but with the hitch and your overall philosophy, which other constructs are more important than the other or are they both equally important? They're both important because look, even from your own experience, eventually people are going to vote with their feet and leave anyways. So you're holding onto them tighter is, isn't going to help you. It's not a good strategy. One, I think that people's skill sets grow when they get an opportunity to contribute elsewhere um, and secondly, we have to allow for, for more jungle gym careers. And that's how people build, uh, you know, adaptability and being agile um, and become sort of great athletes inside the organization. Um, generally speaking, because that shelf life of skills is two to five years, this is a muscle people are going to have to develop anyways. Um, you're going to have to kind of move and evolve your skill sets, you know, on the a two to five year basis. Um, so we're going to see a lot more portfolio careers just because the nature of, of work is changing so much. So I think you've got to balance both. You've got to both allow sort of partial time gigs and projects uh, to work inside your operating model. And you also have to stand up these portfolio careers. So explain the word jungle gym in the context of, of career uh, so that our audience get a sense of what Yeah, I call it progression versus promotion. You know, all of our incentives have been, you know, about these ladders that you climb. And what's a ladder? You take one step above the other, uh, one step at a time. When in fact, a jungle gym career is about at times, sometimes you move sideways to move up. And sideways means a lateral, you take a lateral position um, that, that may teach you new skills. Um, it's just not about climbing that ladder, but by the, by, as a result of you, you know, moving sideways, you actually progressed your career significantly. And I know for myself, um, I had a jungle gym career. I had done work in consulting. I had done work in marketing. I had done work in change management, in HR, in training and development, in structural design, 
um, retail merchandising. I've been a teacher. I have done so many different things. And if I, you know, hindsight is 2020, but when I look back, um, all of those kind of gyrations actually landed me where I am today exactly. in doing well. Uh, yes. I couldn't have scripted it any better. So um, it, it, I think that if we allow these kind of jungle gym careers at scale, it's really going to change the, the nature and success of these organizations. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think that's so true because when you are a CEO, but you've had careers as an HR or as in, in engineering or in product development, you're such, so much better as a CEO because of that wide variety of experience you've had. Um, rather than being a CEO because you just, all you did was sales or all you did was engineering, you know? That's right. Um, Some of the best, I believe, you know, this is, you know, Kelly's armchair psychology, but I do believe that some of the best CEOs will, will have been CHROs at some point in time, or they should have, they should be because 80% of running that organization is so much around people. I, we know 80% of the cost is talent for sure. Um, so the extent you can really uh, accentuate your success in the talent area, you're going to make a huge difference for your company. Um, and so, you know, managing people and, and certainly I, I used to say that as the CHRO, I was Cyrano de Bergiac. I was like in the bushes. So, you know, okay, say this, don't say that. Here's what you should do. Um, you know, helping that CEO both personally and professionally in that job. Um, and so to a certain extent, CHROs have learned to run the company just mm -hmm. silently. Right. And I think I, I, make a, I, I make a big stink about this, that CHROs and HR leaders need to be part of the strategy discussion. They can't be like an afterthought saying, hey, I came up with a strategy, let's do OKRs. And then give it to CHR and say, you go and now we go and implement it. That's not how it works, right? It's it's a collective decision. You're working together, the CEO, the CHR, right. they all have to work together. That's right. They, and anytime I've, you know, I would not take a CHRO role that was reporting anywhere else except the CEO, because it was a statement, one, about the importance they place on human capital issues. Uh, and, and two, um, my sort of seat at the table and my ability to influence uh, what was happening in that organization around talent would be diminished. Um, yes. It would be more about managing the operations of HR or the costs and compliance issues if reporting to legal. Uh, so it, it just was, you know, imperative for, you know, even getting people to work for you in human resources that you reported to the CEO. Yeah, yeah. And I think, what happens is many organizations, at least in the smaller ones, a lot of the CHROs or head of HR really is somebody who was an admin assistant at some point as an office manager and they become, and they started running payroll one day and suddenly now they're in HR. And then because mm -hmm. there was nobody else, they became the head of HR after a few years. Um, or they were a recruiter and they become a head of HR in after a few years. So I think, I think people need to really think about HR role differently and be, be more strategic about it. So hundred percent agree with you on that. Um, now the one thing, go, coming back to your uh, hitch and now uh, at uh, Workforce Innovation Products with uh, ServiceNow, I, I see the reason for your success and the success of organizations like ServiceNow to acquire you in the first place and see that, have that foresight, is because the world of work, the future of work as you call it, um, is changing where, and I, I use this word, uh, quite often these days is giving, because we are starting to give people agency in their careers, in their life. And the, and that's really, the future of work is really about, I feel a shift in the balance of power. Earlier employees, employers had a lot of power and the future of work with the pandemic and all the acceleration around it has changed that balance of power where people want agency. Um, so wh what is your prognosis, you know, what's caused that A and then B, how do you see that in a few years from now? Well, to some degree, it's law of economics, right? Uh, when, we, when our supply dips below demand, we have to think a little bit differently. But one, one major issue is that um, we realize that we have to start treating our employees like consumers. You know, we are, to, to a certain degree, 
having to give them a much better experience, a much more personalized, customized experience. And we have to care about our employees like we have traditionally done for customers. So it, it can, it, the, the, when you say balance of power is sort of the emphasis is no longer on, you should be so lucky to work for me for 30 or 40 years to, I should be so lucky to have you for two to five years and for you to contribute while you're here. Right. And the new deal is that while you're in my company for two to five years, I'm going to make sure that this is a great place to work, that you learn the skills and capabilities that are most important. And, and you sort of build your, you know, build your skill repertoire. That's, that's sort of the new deal and that you can contribute as much as possible while you're here. Um, and so that is, you know, my parents grew up, you know, working for 30 to 40 years for the same organization. I'll never forget when I was consulting the Pacific Gas and Electric Company in my um, early 30s, and I was sitting next to somebody who had worked at the company longer than I'd been on the earth. And for me, <laughs> that just blew my mind. Um, so I can imagine what the next generations are going, going to be like with these portfolio careers. Um, yeah, yeah. So it almost, you know, the analogy of, I'm, I'm a big Cardinals fan in St. Louis. The analogy of baseball always comes to me when I think about this, right? There are, you know, Pujols, one of the biggest uh, uh, batters in the history of baseball, left St. Louis, came back after almost a decade, and uh, is going to retire with the St. Louis Cardinals jersey. And I think about the employer-employee relationship to some extent like that. You know, these mm -hmm. these players had agency. They have an agent. They have an agency. They can they choose their career. If they don't work out, they go somewhere else where they're more valued. Maybe they'll come back. You know, and there's no love lost uh, or or a hatred because of that because it's just the way it is. Maybe it's not going to be as fluid and as performance based as baseball is because if you don't perform in one season, you're out. You know. But it, maybe it's not like that. But this little bit shift in mindset, I, I see with that as well. I don't know. If that's that's right. I think people, um, you know, that this new deal uh, for employees has them really being their own agent of their career, um, thinking through um, things that that maybe our parents didn't necessarily when the company was sort of the steward of them is that they have to be stewards for their for themselves. Um, they have to ask themselves these questions and, and they certainly did as a result of the pandemic. Am I working for the company I want to? Am I in a job that motivates and engages me? Do I work for a manager that cares about me as a person and my career? And, you know, so much reflection on core values that you, you're gonna see a lot of organizations having to be very forward with their mission and purpose and certainly moving to this more consumer-like experience for employees, knowing that employees are the agents of their career, they're making decisions, um, sort of reflecting on both their core values and whether this is a place they can be successful, even if it's two to five years. Right. Um, I want to switch the topic a little bit. There's one thing that you've talked about in the past, and I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about that. And you talk about this new talent operating model. Now, how does that fit with this this whole thing we've been talking about just now? And maybe explain that a little bit. So uh, anybody that's gone to business schools probably talked about operating model, which is sort of the, you know, the inputs or our core values and strategy and um, people, process, and technology are sort of the operating model. And what I mean by talent operating model is that we have to look at what traditional operating model was around organizational structures, capabilities, and technology, and sort of reimagine it. Um, we can't live necessarily in hierarchies anymore because the work has changed and we have to break that down and be more agile. We have to push decision-making down quite significantly. In terms of the type of capabilities and skills we need, it's not necessarily about who fits a role, but what are the skills and capabilities, you know, that supply chain of skills that we need to manage. And when it comes to technology, uh, we need to consumerize it a lot more 
Uh, we need to give people a great experience. People expect this iPhone at work. Um, and so we, we have to sort of rethink our technology. We traditionally built all of our HR systems for the back office to make things easier for administration, but that sort of follows the old line of thinking, right? Right. In this new sort of agency model, people expect the technology to speak to them and to facilitate uh, their work being easier. So this is what I mean about operating models. We, we just have to reimagine the whole thing. And lastly, on incentives, um, incentives were really built around the assumptions that we were going to work in these hierarchical models, and that just isn't the future. So we need more team-based uh, recognition um, than more individual. Mm -hmm. So do you... So there are two, to two topics there that you mentioned uh, that I want to touch upon briefly. One is, are we going to see a breakdown of maybe hierarchy to more hol holacracy type of model because of that? Um, and two, are we going to see more individual-based performance uh, performance assessments or reviews or uh, and performance bonuses to become more team-based? Or is there some nuances there? Well, I think that we will always have a set of core jobs really based on the industry or the vertical that we're working in. We'll always have some type of core, but we'll, what will change is that the entire organization will not be in the core. So therefore, we, we create more of the agency model um, for, let's say, you know, 60% of the company is going to be moving around into these, you know, portfolio opportunities or broad based contribution. And so we, you know, we're going to be changing, um, you know, the way that we have traditionally worked. And if we think about you know, it is about capabilities, it's about culture, it's about rewards, it's about, a, you know, um, all of these sort of levers around the organization that drive this new operating model. Um, so we just cannot, you know, I think I use the analogy of the Fisher Price toy that we get when, when we're little and it's to teach us you know, cause and effect. When I put a triangle in the triangle shape, you know, it goes through. Um, what we have done in HR, and that box sort of represents the old operating models, we take the shiny new thing and we try, you know, the circle and we try to shove it into a triangle. We try to take the old performance management process and, you know, shove it into the old model and it doesn't work and we're confused. We have to rethink the yellow box. We have to blow that up. We have to, you know, change a lot of the processes that we used to have. And that's very uncomfortable for human resources professionals. Um, but that's the way forward. We're just going to have to, um, and be willing to break it again, by the way. I always say we have to learn, unlearn, and relearn multiple times. Um, and from this day forward, uh, that's what the future of work is going to be about. Yeah. So I'm almost thinking of a concept of maybe rethinking the concept of shared services in, in this way, right? So you have this 40% that's in core areas of marketing and sales and engineering and, you know, whatever other roles you have, then you have 60% that's really like a shared pool that can be fluid based on where the need is the most for the organization. And so that way there's no talent hoarding of the 60% that can be free agents within the company, obviously, in this case. Is that a right way to think about this? That's right, because if you think about it, you know, the company ultimately has one P&L, right? There is a set of core objectives, a set of core product that the company needs to get, get out the door. And if you have uh, this agency model working for you, then the, you know, much of that, you know, 60% can be moved towards the work that is changing and dynamic and where, where those skills are needed most while the core, you know, sort of keeps uh, the, the engine warm and running. And, and that's, that's what I see will happen in the future, just because, you know, if you think about, um, let's take automotive, for example, automotive was an industry that's been around for so long and it's, it's, it's been so much about the hardware of the car. And now it, it, you know, as IOT is rising and electric vehicles, um, it's more about the software in the car than the hardware, but you see how difficult it is for automotive to make that transition from, 
you know, hardware, you know, combustion engines to electric, it changes their whole talent profile, their operating models, the business model, everything is changing. Now, how do you take a, you know, an industry that is, has built its entire reputation and processes around a different model? Um, this is a huge challenge. And so um, that's just one example, but many, many industries are going to have to rethink um, how they're operating. And so I don't think we're going to move to that, you know, 60% agency model right away. It is going to be a slow roll towards it, but we can, you know, through the pandemic, you can see that, you know, some companies were contracting and some were growing and they had to rethink their, their business models. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of that. I think your uh, solution that uh, at Hitch really supports that, right? Because once you have a job board or a, a bo not a justly job board, but a, a gig board where, hey, I need somebody to write a white paper on this, or I need somebody to um, run a campaign here or, or whatever that is, right? That automatically forces an organization to take some level of agency-based approach for that 60% or whatever the X percent is for that organization. That, that's absolutely right. I think that uh, the organizations, um, they're going to have to, to be more adaptable. And I think that, that that sort of filters into leadership as well. So what is the DNA of leadership that will have to change? Um, we're gonna see a lot of people with non-traditional backgrounds coming into to leadership roles. And as I tell my oldest son, who's gonna graduate from college this year, you know, your, commun your communication skills, your ability to adapt to change, as I said, learn, unlearn, relearn is going to be the muscle you will lean into most because there is no, almost no way to prepare uh, for what is coming. It's going to be how well can you adapt and even reimagine yourself. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, Kelly. It's been a pleasure having you on, 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 on this podcast. I wish we had another 30 minutes or an hour and I can keep going on this subject because I love the way- Likewise, a huge passion for this uh, I have as well. Yeah, well, thanks a lot. Until uh, next time. Okay, thank you. Sri Chalapa here. Thank you so much for listening to the People Strategy Leaders Podcast. If you are a successful leader, or a people strategist who would like to be on this program, please visit engagedly.com slash people strategy leaders podcast. If you got something out of this interview, would you share this episode on social media? If you know someone that would be a great guest, tag them on social media to let them know about the show and include the hashtag people strategy leaders. I love seeing your posts and guest suggestions. We are regularly putting out new episodes and content. To make sure you don't miss any episodes, go ahead and subscribe. Your thumbs up, ratings, and reviews go a long way to help promote the show and mean a lot to me and my team. Want to know more? Follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter at Sri Chalapa. Thanks for listening. We will see you next time. And thank you to Patrick Ramsey, sound engineer at Kalinga Production Studios, for recording and mixing this show.